welcome everyone sincerely for joining us today in what is the final session in our first ever Cambridge Mean Online experience. The response to the series of webinars has been truly, truly astounding. I mean, far exceeding our initial estimations and even hopes of how many of you we could engage. We've had 64,000 registrations, 16,000 individuals across 94 countries making this not really a MENA event, but really a truly global one. So I think for everyone who's participated, it, you should be really proud of that and part of something that is much, much larger than we had ever in our wildest dreams hoped. We've had the most registrations from India, uh, followed closely by Lebanon and Saudi Arabia. So uh, really strong shout out to, to especially Lebanon with such a small population showing up so strongly. Uh, it's, it's great. And my name is Matthew Santisper. I am the regional manager for the MENA region for Cambridge University Press. And um, when we launched this series 13 days ago, I was sitting in the exact same place as I am now. Um, I'm, I'm guessing many of you are as well, if you are joining us in any of these sessions. Um, and that's because I think these are extraordinary times with many of us experiencing a variety of emotions, anxiety, sorrow, fear, boredom, lots of boredom. Um, but the overwhelming response to this event, it really amplifies what began 13 days ago. And what I was saying then is that we are, and we will continue to be a community, a community of teachers, community of learners, community that seeks out knowledge, and the fact that so many of you around the world have joined us just proves that the desire to learn is fundamental to our existence and that it will never cease. And we at Cambridge will continue to dedicate ourselves to this process of learning and development, of supporting teachers, instructors, students, and learners of all ages. So I think really just, again, thank you to everyone. Um, I have some specific thanks to give out. Uh, first of all, to our amazing speakers, for their wonderful and varied presentations. I think if you've caught one of these, the yes, they can all stand on their own as individual sessions, but if you've been able to see several or even all of them, you see they fit in together as a pattern where it's been just an, a very, very uh, interesting and, and multifarious way that things have fit together to get to the last session today. So it's been, it's been except, excellent. They've been a huge part of the event and they'll continue to inspire us. And I'd like to thank our colleagues at Cambridge Assessment who have supported us and done a wonderful job promoting these sessions. Our fantastic MENA team who've gotten behind this event, especially our colleagues, Army and Razim. Without Raz, the technology, the marketing, the messaging, and even the certificates would not get out to you. So everybody thank Raz, even if you, know, you don't know him, just thank him anyway. Um, and he'll be posting a links for the certificates at the end. So please wait until then. You'll see a QR code and a link. And finally, I would just like to thank the man of the hour, my colleague, my friend, Peter Luke and Tony. Without Peter, this series simply would not have happened. So I'm turning the stage to him as he's far more comfortable there than I am. And he's going to deliver the final webinar of the series called Oracy, Definition, Rationale and Skills Confirmation. So over to you, Peter. They're all in your hands. Right. Thanks so much, uh, Matt. And thanks for being with us and supporting us from day one until uh, uh, the final day today. It actually feels quite emotional. Um, I've uh, either been delivering or listening in uh, to all of the uh, 13 webinars. And I can see, uh, uh, as Matt has said, we, we literally have people from all over the world. And it's such a shame that we can't get more than 3,000 in uh, to any one particular session. Um, but um, that's one of the limitations of, of, of Zoom technology. But anyway, thanks again to everybody, and we'll have more information at the end of the session about how you can get your certificates and how you can get um, to see uh, previous webinars. Could we ask you, please, don't fill the chat box with questions about certificates. We will deal with it um, at the end. And if you have specific questions on the content of the webinar, please post them in the Q&A um, uh, facility, not, not in the chat box. Okay, I think by now you probably know who I am, Peter Luke and Tony. Um, my dad was Italian, my, my mum is English, um, but I've been in the business for uh, over 40 years, uh, various um, uh, jobs within uh, our profession. 
teacher, manager, teacher, trainer, author, consultant, and I'm currently the professional learning and development manager for the Middle East and North Africa for Cambridge University Press. So what I'd like to do um, in this final webinar is address four things. The first one is to have a look at what um, ORAC actually is, and that's where our, our definition will come from. And then secondly, have a think about what we actually need uh, ORAC for, and there is the rationale, which comes from our title. And then we're going to finish uh, this webinar by looking at classroom practices and how we actually uh, incorporate uh, ORAC into the classroom. So that's where the third part of the, the title comes from, the skills. So we're looking at ORAC definition, rationale, uh, and skills. So let's begin with the first part then, which is having a think about um, what oracy is. And I, I want to address this question by uh, quickly doing a little um, speaking activity with you. But just before we do the speaking activity, I have a, a quick question for you. And I'd like you just to type your answers um, into the chat box uh, when you see what my specific question is. You, you, you don't need to type anything yet. Wait until you see what the question is. So the question is, there are two parts to the question really, uh, and the first part of the question is this, it's asking you what makes a speaking activity effective? And, and just to gloss that and just to expand on it slightly, what criteria might you use to evaluate a classroom speaking activity? Now before you uh, start typing, please stop typing, don't start yet, um, I, I need to give you a bit more help here. So what are the criteria that we would use to evaluate a classroom speaking activity? And as an example, we might think of relevancy. In other words, can the learners actually connect with the topic? How appropriate is it for their age and for their culture? So what we're saying here is that in order for a speaking activity to be effective, one of the main criteria is that the activity needs to be relevant in some way to the learners. And therefore, of course, the more relevant the activity is, the more effective it will be for our learners. So the first criterion is relevancy. I'd like you now to type into the, uh, into the uh, chat box a few of your own ideas about what you think makes um, an effective um, speaking activity. I'll give you about 30 seconds. Okay, remember that remember the question is asking you to think about speaking activities, not oracy specifically. So what, what criteria could you use to evaluate a classroom speaking activity? Okay, I can see vocabulary, content, show and tell. Okay, 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 great. Some nice ideas coming in. Yep. Okay. Lovely. Great ideas. Okay, so I'm going to show you um, a list, a list of criteria. Of course, it's not um, the only list. It's not a definitive list. Um, there are many more things which could go um, into this list. But these are the these are the ones that I want to focus on um, in this in this webinar today. So here's the one we just mentioned: relevancy. How um, appropriate is the is the activity and the content? What the students are talking about? How relevant is it uh, to our students? The second important criterion is, is the element of choice. Now here we're not talking about choice for the teacher, we're talking about choice for the learners. Do the learners have an opportunity to make choices uh, within the actual speaking activity? Of course, as soon as you're given uh, a choice, as soon as you're able to make a choice, then you're much more in control, you're much more engaged, much more motivated uh, uh, to uh, uh, participate in that actual activity. So our first two criteria then, relevancy, uh, choice. Uh, third one, and this is in some ways linked to the first one, relevancy, but my third one is personalization. Are the students able to personalize any of the, uh, any aspects of the uh, speaking activity? Are they able to include references to themselves um, or are they having to uh, talk about something which has no connection with them? So I, th I think you can see there is a, a direct link there between relevancy and, and personalization. 
The fourth one, and I think this is important and we sometimes forget um, that speaking um, is not a solitary skill. It does involve uh, many other skills and we'll be looking at those during the rest of um, this, this webinar. But the fourth one is um, that a speaking activity, a really effective speaking activity, needs to encourage real listening. In other words, we want the people who are listening to us to be really engaged in their listening, to be listening actively, if you prefer. That, that might be a better word than real, but to encourage active listening. So it doesn't just go in one ear and, and go out of the other. Um, it encourages listening, which uh, may indeed um, uh, require a response uh, from the people who are listening. My fifth uh, criterion, and again, I think it's a particularly important one and one that perhaps we sometimes forget uh, in classroom situations when we're um, engaging students in speaking activities, is the fact that we need clear objectives. There has to be a clear objective for the speaking activity. In other words, why are the students doing it? What's the purpose of the speaking activity? Uh, do they understand uh, what the goal of the, of the speaking activity is? Do they understand why they're being asked to do this particular activity? Possibly the, uh, the objective, the goal, could actually have been discussed with the students and agreed uh, with the students. But again, uh, this is something we'll come back to uh, a bit later. And the, the sixth and the final one that I want to mention here, and perhaps I should just reiterate that this is not um, a finite list. There are, there are many other uh, criteria that, 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 that you could include, but these are the six that I want to focus on. But my sixth one is that the speaking activity, in order to be um, effective, needs to include some sort of information or opinion gap. In other words, the people involved in the activity don't all have the same information. Because as soon as we create an information or, or an opinion gap, this will um, encourage real communication to actually take place. So those are my uh, six criteria. So what we're gonna do now is to apply them to um, a speaking activity. Uh, I'm going to show you a speaking activity and I'd like you to uh, evaluate uh, the speaking activity using these six criteria. In other words, does the speaking activity allow for relevance, choice, personalization? Does it encourage real listening? Does it have a clear objective? And is there uh, an information or opinion gap? So here's my um, activity. Some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not. Um, I'll briefly explain it. Obviously, in this context, in this uh, medium, we can't actually do the speaking activity, unfortunately, but I hope you will be able to um, uh, understand it so that when we get back into uh, the classroom, uh, we will be able to use it. So it's called Find Someone Who, and um, I'll show you the activity in a, in a minute on the next screen, but I want you to uh, keep thinking about um, how effective it is and whether or not it meets the six criteria that we've just discussed. Okay, so in the Find Someone Who uh, speaking activity, students need to mingle, students need to talk to each other and find people who can do uh, particular things. I'm just going to give you some examples. You can, of course, change the examples to whatever suits your particular situation. So here it is. Here's an example of Find Someone Who. And you can see on the left-hand side, numbered one, two, three, four, the students need to find someone who has been to China. They need to find someone who can bake a cake and who understands French uh, and to find someone who never drinks milk. So the first thing the students need to do is to create a question from those uh, stems. So number one, find someone who's been to China. The question, of course, would be, have you ever been to China? I can see someone is saying it's not personalized, but I haven't finished explaining the activity yet. So hopefully when I've finished, you'll realize that actually it can be very personalized. So just hold on a minute. So the first question then would be, find someone who has been to China. The second one, um, who can bake a cake? Or indeed, can you bake a cake? Uh, do you understand French? Um, do you ever drink milk? This, these could be the questions. So first of all, students are forming questions and you'll see in the next column, um, it says person. Now in that column, 
the, uh, the speaker needs to write the name of the person who they found. So if I ask Muhammad, have you been to China? And Muhammad says, yes, I write Muhammad's name in the person column. If I say to um, Ali or Fatima, uh, can you bake a cake? And they reply, no, I put nothing in the person column and I have to ask somebody else. So basically, I need to complete the person column with the names of people who can do something or who have done something or who can understand something. And then you'll notice on the far right, there's a column which says follow-up information. Now, for the follow-up information, and this is where the personalization comes in, if Muhammad says yes, I need to ask Muhammad a follow-up question. For example, when did you go? Who did you go with? Did you have a good time? What was your purpose for going? So that's where the personalization comes in. That's where the students have an opportunity to personalize. I agree 100% that the find someone who aspect is not personalized. And indeed, it's actually quite mechanical. But there's nothing wrong um, in doing mechanical um, controlled practice of, of structures uh, from time to time, as long as they lead into something uh, which is um, slightly less controlled. So I hope I've um, explained uh, the activity to you. I've just got four examples on the screen. You could, of course, have six or eight or ten, uh, depending on um, you know what, what you want to do. You might also notice that in the uh, find someone who section, I've got different structures uh, in each of my uh, four uh, sentence stems. Now, it, you can use the find someone who activity very, very effectively to practice uh, one particular structure. For example, if we wanted to practice the present perfect, then all of the find someone who's um, could include has been or have been. So find someone who's been to China, find someone who's eaten chocolate cake, find someone who has done something. So if you wanted to focus on a particular grammatical structure like the present perfect, you could do that. If you wanted to focus on modals, uh, you could make sure that all of the structures contain uh, a modal and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the activity. But as I said, um, I'm showing you the activity because what I'd really like you to do is to think about whether or not it meets any of the six criteria uh, that we mentioned earlier. So first of all, the first one was relevancy. And we mentioned that um, relevancy is about um, how appropriate an activity is for students. Um, how relevant is it to them uh, in, in terms of their, their lives and what they know and what they don't know. Now, the four examples I've just shown you um, are probably uh, not particularly relevant to you. Uh, but of course, as I said, you can change those examples um, to fit uh, to be more relevant uh, for your particular students. So I think uh, for that first criterion, um, I think we can tick the box. The second criterion was choice. And I think there are different elements of choice uh, within this particular activity. Uh, first of all, the students have a choice of who they actually talk to. Uh, remember, they need to find someone who can or has done uh, all of the, um, the, the find someone who activities. So there's choice in who the students talk to. But of course, there's even more choice when we get to the follow up question. So the students have choice not only in who they speak to, but in the type of questions um, that, the, um, that, that, that the students ask each other. The third element was the personalization. And, and as somebody put in the chat box, um, there isn't really any personalization in the find someone who question, but there is a degree of personalization when you uh, ask the follow up questions. Fourthly, does the activity encourage real listening? Well, absolutely. Uh, particularly in the uh, follow-up section. It's very important that the person whose name has gone into the box in the person column, it's very important that they are actively listening to the follow-up question that the person asks them. And indeed, the speaker uh, needs to listen carefully because they need to write the answer to the question in the follow-up info column. And our fifth criterion was does the activity have a clear objective? And again, I think um, this activity does have a clear objective. Um, obviously, it's to find someone who, that's one of the objectives, but more importantly, um, is to uh, make sure that students produce 
uh, a follow-up question and get an answer to it and uh, make a note uh, of the answer that they receive. And then finally, the sixth criterion, is there uh, an information or uh, a, a, an opinion gap? And of course there is, because we're trying to find someone who. Uh, we're asking each other, well, the students are asking each other questions in an attempt uh, to find someone who's done something and then to um, find out the follow-up information. So I think find someone who, um, it's been around a very, very long time. It's, a, it's, it's certainly not a new activity. Uh, there are variations on it. I've seen um, find someone who bingo, um, lots and lots of different variations on it, uh, mainly in, a, in an attempt to drag it away uh, from what was at one time quite a mechanical activity. Uh, but I think the, um, the addition of the follow-up question does make the activity far more engaging and uh, communicative. Okay, so what then is oracy? We're still on this question of, of what oracy is. And um, the word oracy goes back probably 50, 55 years now uh, to Professor Andrew Wilkinson at Birmingham University in the UK. He was, he was the person who first used the term um, oracy back in uh, 1965. And um, Professor Wilkinson thought that it was um, important to have um, a term, uh, if you like, for the skills of speaking and listening. Because for many years, we've referred to literacy as the skills of um, reading and writing. Uh, and it was felt that to some degree, uh, speaking and listening were, were being neglected simply because uh, there was no term to describe them. So Professor Andrew Wilkinson uh, first used the term oracy um, 50 odd years ago. And as I said, he, he felt that speaking and listening skills were, were often neglected in the classroom, uh, in the second language classroom, uh, because I think um, that there's an assumption that uh, oral skills, speaking and listening skills are, are often learned outside the classroom. This, of course, is the case with, uh, with first language. Uh, children learn how to speak and they learn how to listen at home. And then um, more of it goes on when they go to school. And that's where they really uh, learn their reading and writing skills. Obviously, they may learn some at, some at home. But um, generally speaking, reading and writing are things which are learned um, at school. So I think the, um, um, the understanding was that in the second language classroom, or even the third language classroom, speaking and listening skills um, were often neglected because there was this assumption that speaking and listening were actually being learned uh, elsewhere. So let's remember then that oracy skills are learned um, in, the, in the very first years of life from a very, very young age, from the age of what, one year, 12, 14 months, children begin to make noises, uh, they begin to make sounds, and slowly, slowly, uh, they're, they're, they're changing into words. And these oracy skills just develop and develop and develop uh, throughout our lives and, and never, never stop. So... We have a sort of a definition, but let's have a think about um, what, what oracy actually involves. And something that we mentioned, um, we've already mentioned in the criteria for an effective speaking activity is that oracy um, definitely involves attentive listening. It's very easy, isn't it, to, to sit in a classroom, in a lecture room, uh, in front of the television uh, and listen, but are you actually listening attentively? Are you actually retaining anything? Uh, as somebody's written in the text box, this is often referred to as, as active listening, doing something with what you're actually listening to. So one of the skills of oracy is not just listening, but more importantly, attentive listening. And we'll come back to uh, all of these element, elements of oracy as we move through the webinar. A second important thing is an understanding of turn taking, knowing when it's time to stop, knowing when it's time to let another person have their turn. And particularly with, with children, very young children, um, often children find this very difficult to understand that it's, it's important uh, that they should give their friends or their, their classmates a turn uh, and to stop. Um, it's a bit um, it's sort of connected with sharing as well. Uh, you know, we encourage children to share their toys and share their books. Um, it's, 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 it's almost the same in speaking, that we're, we're asking children to share uh, the opportunity to, uh, to speak by taking turns. 
And a third um, element of oracy, and I would say at a, a higher cognitive level, is, is the ability to explain, the ability to uh, reformulate. Um, and of course, this is based on um, an understanding that the person that you're speaking to or the people uh, that you're speaking to haven't actually understood what you're saying. And therefore, you may need to reformulate, you may need to change uh, what you've said, uh, explain something in a slightly different way uh, to make it easier for people to understand. And also linked in with that, and as I said, for explaining and reformulating, probably on a slightly higher level, is the ability uh, to ask questions and to seek information uh, and to ask for clarification when you haven't understood something. Um, and I think certainly in classroom situations, we, 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 we may not always understand how important it is um, to make sure that, that our learners have the language in order to ask a question or to seek clarification. The student who sits there and doesn't ask anything, you may either think that they're lazy or bored or they don't understand, but maybe what they really need is some more language so that they can actually ask a question in order to get something clarified or to seek uh, more information. Three more aspects that I'd like to show you of uh, oracy. Uh, the uh, fifth one is giving reasons and justifications. And again, we're building on uh, the things that we've just been looking at. We're moving to a higher uh, cognitive le uh, level. Uh, part of oracy is the ability to, to justify what I've said, to be able to support uh, my arguments uh, with, with sound reasoning, possibly at a, at a more advanced level uh, with, with um, citations from, from research or examples from research. And LinkedIn, with the whole idea of participating in discussions and talking to other people is being able to build on what I've said, being able to expand on my ideas, but also to take in other people's ideas and build those uh, in, in, into my own. And the final thing I want to point out about oracy is the ability to choose the appropriate language. Do I need my language to be formal or do I need it to be informal? Do I need to be using this aspect or, or that aspect? What would be the most appropriate uh, aspects of grammar to use with this particular uh, thing that, I, that I'm talking about? So I deliberately put choosing appropriate language at the end because when we tend, when we, when we talk about language, when we talk about reading, writing, listening and speaking, uh, you know, we often, we often think about vocab and grammar. But certainly where oracy is concerned, we need to think about all of these other skills uh, that we've been talking about uh, so far. Uh, the ones on the screen, giving reasons, building on your ideas, choosing appropriate language, but also things like uh, attentive listening and taking turns and explaining and reformulating and uh, the ability to ask and, and seek uh, clarification. Now, I don't know if any of you were um, with uh, Ben Knight this morning when he did his wonderful talk on the um, Cambridge framework uh, for, of, uh, of life competencies. And he mentioned that Cambridge has uh, a framework. Uh, surprise, surprise, Cambridge has a framework for oracy skills as well. Um, and it's called the Cambridge Oracy Skills Framework. And the framework identifies four main oracy skills. And uh, we're going to have a look at what the uh, main four oracy skills are and have a think uh, about what's contained uh, in each one. So I'm going to give you the first letter of each of the four main skills. And I'd like you to type in the chat box what you think the skill is. And it's not pronunciation. You need to think much, much more broadly. No, it's not pronunciation. You need to think much, much more broadly. Pronunciation is, is, an, is an example. It's a sub-skill. We need to think more broadly. Physical, somebody has put. So I've seen physical in the chat box. So yes, the first one is uh, physical. And we'll have a look at what these mean uh, in just a moment. The second one begins with the letter L. So any ideas? what you think L is. You can type it. Somebody's put logical, nice idea, listening. Yeah. Language, 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 listening, listening, linguistic. There we go. The second one is uh, linguistic. And the third one 
begins with C and it's not communication, it's not comprehension. Any ideas? Context, no. Content, no. Cognitive, there we go. Cognitive is the third one. And the fourth one is actually two words, S and E. S and E. Any ideas? Yep, somebody's got it. Social and emotional. So the four main, the four broad oracy skills that are identified uh, in the um, Cambridge Oracy Skills Framework are physical, linguistic, cognitive, social, and uh, emotional. And within those, within the four broad categories, we then have uh, subcategories. So let's have a look at what the subcategories are, and then we'll have a look at some examples of what's within the subcategories. So the first broad skill is physical, and within the physical category, this includes the voice, and it includes uh, the body language, which we use. We'll come back and look at uh, some specific examples of this in, in, in just a moment. The second uh, main oracy skill is the linguistic one. And no surprises here. You can see vocabulary, you can see language variety, you can see structure, which, which really means the, the organization of what I'm saying, and you can also see uh, rhetorical techniques, for example, uh, metaphor and humor in um, what I'm talking about. The third one is the cognitive, and here we have uh, the content, the things that I'm talking about, the ability to clarify and summarize, which we saw uh, previously, self-regulation, and self-regulation here means the ability to, uh, to stay on task, my task focus, and how I manage my time. Uh, that would be included in uh, self-regulation. Uh, reasoning, and this is to do with supporting my own views. And again, you'll notice this from um, uh, what we talked about earlier when we were talking about what oracy involves. And uh, the, the fifth one within cognitive is uh, audience awareness. And this could be um, as simple as just grading my language to the level of the audience. And then the third one was the uh, social and emotional. And here we've got working with others, the ability to listen, to listen attentively and to respond. And very importantly, uh, to have confidence uh, in my speaking, to have confidence to stand up uh, in front of people and actually uh, make a presentation if indeed that's what the uh, speaking involves. And all of this information, as I said, comes from the Cambridge Oracy Skills Framework, and this um, has been put together by the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge, and you can just see a page grab there with the, uh, the link at the top, um, the Oracy Toolkit. Uh, you can easily find it if you just Google Cambridge Oracy, you'll easily find it. Okay, so let's give you a little test now. See what, uh, see what you can do. Obviously, it's very difficult. We've got 3,000 of you taking the test uh, and only one chat box. So this is going to be a bit of a bit, bit chaotic, but let, let's see how we go. Um, I'm going to give you um, 14, I think it is, um, sub-skills. And I want you to think which of the four broad skills these skills go into. So in other words, is clarity of pronunciation um, in the physical box, the linguistic box, the cognitive box, or the social and emotional box. Now, just to get you started, um, clarity of pronunciation goes into the physical box, because in order for our pronunciation to be clear, we need to use our mouth, we need to use our lips, we need to use our, our tongue, our whole mouth. So this is very much um, a physical aspect of oracy. So I'm going to put the others on the screen. Uh, it's 12, not 14. So you've got 11 more uh, to do. So if you like, I'll give you about a minute just to do a few. Um, you can put the number in the box and then follow it with P for physical, L for linguistic, C for cognitive, or S for social and emotional. So I'll just, just give you a minute and see what, see what we get. Maybe some of you start at the bottom and work up. Otherwise, everyone's going to be doing two, three, four. Some of you start with 12 and then do 11 and 10 and 9, so we get a nice spread. 
Okay, the minute starts now. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Hanan, for starting at the bottom. Thank you, Sidi. Thank you, Rizki. Great, lots of great answers coming in. Well done. About another 30 seconds. You don't have to finish them all, of course. It's not really a test. Great, wonderful, really good, really good. Okay, 10 more seconds. Yeah, excellent, lots of great answers. Okay, don't worry if you didn't manage to do them all. It's, as I said, it's not, not uh, just a bit of fun, really. So let's have a look. Here's all the answers for you. And hopefully there won't be um, too many surprises there. But as I said, clarity of pronunciation, this is to do with how you actually form the words. It's not about the selection of the words, but it's about how you actually form the words. So this is very much uh, a physical element of, of oracy. Um, how we um, structure and organize the talk, this is linguistic. Time management, as we've already mentioned, um, is to do with content. And number four, self-assurance. This is about your confidence, how you project yourself as a speaker. So this is very much on the social and the emotional side. Our fluency and the pace of speech, how the speed at which we're able to produce language. Uh, again, this is very much a physical um, uh, element of oracy. And then six and seven, grammar register belong to linguistic. And uh, number eight, being able to stay on task. This is to do with the cognitive side. Turn-taking, knowing when to give another person a chance, is our um, social and emotional. And then for number uh, 10, uh, listening uh, actively. Again, this is social and emotional. Facial expression, eye contact is physical. And summarizing, again, is content. Obviously, um, you can find out, uh, find a lot more information and detail um, if you just google uh, Cambridge Oracy Skills Framework uh, you'll be able to find a lot more information but hopefully this is beginning to make and um, or raise your awareness of the fact that Oracy is not uh, only about uh, language it's not about speaking and listening it's about all of the sub skills which are involved uh, in effective speaking and listening and just to, just to sort of try and bring all of this together, uh, Wilkinson, who first came up with the term oracy a couple of years later, um, uh, Wilkinson made the point, let's not think of oracy um, as, a, as a particular subject. Oracy is not something um, that um, we can teach on its own because oracy is actually, uh, as Wilkinson said, oracy is a condition of learning in all subjects. So oracy is not a subject in itself, but it's something which needs to exist in all the subjects that we're teaching. Now, I don't know if we have any teachers with us today who are not English teachers, but what Wilkinson is saying is it doesn't matter whether you're teaching English or even Arabic or, or even Kurdish or, or Turkish or Japanese or Spanish or Greek. It doesn't matter. And indeed, it doesn't matter if you're teaching maths or geography or history. Oracy is still an incredibly important condition uh, in all subjects because oracy is actually a means of learning. If we don't have effective oracy skills, then our ability to learn is definitely going to be uh, inhibited. So what do we need it for? Well, yes, I can see somebody saying science. Yes, it doesn't matter what your subject is, uh, oracy is important because I think, and I think the next slide will highlight why this is because in all subjects, in all uh, situations, we want our students, for example, to make presentations. It doesn't matter if it's a presentation about a chemical reaction or how language works or why uh, Mount Everest is the highest mountain in the world. We still want our students to make presentations. And within a presentation, we want our students to be, sorry, to be able to explain their ideas uh, with confidence and we want clarity and we want them to be able to persuade us. And it doesn't matter if I'm doing that in, in Japanese or, or Arabic or English, and it doesn't matter if I'm talking about science or maths or geography. Um, the, 
I, I still need to be able to do those things. And part of that, of course, part of um, even what we're doing now, even though it's remotely, uh, we need to be able to engage uh, in discussions. Um, it's obviously a, very much a, a one-way discussion. There's me and there's 3,000 of you, but um, I'm doing my best to engage in a discussion with you. And in order to do that effectively, I need uh, particular oracy skills. A third thing, or a third area, let's say, that we need um, uh, oracy for, and this will um, uh, be very uh, familiar to you, um, and, and I've actually seen questions this week in the webinars um, about exactly this, is that uh, we need oracy for students to work well in groups uh, to find solutions to problems. If students don't have strong oracy skills, they won't be able to work well uh, in groups. I can't remember which of our speakers mentioned group work earlier in the week, uh, but it was certainly something that we discussed. And I, I remember saying um, in the in the Q&A that we would uh, refer to this uh, in the final work in the final webinar today. And of course, an important part of working well in groups is that we can then help others to learn. Um, you know, stronger students helping less able students. Um, having students work as classroom assistants. Uh, in order to do this effectively, then students need uh, to have uh, good, strong oracy skills. And the last one, um, or the last area, if you like, that we need oracy for, and I, I think this is uh, probably the most important because it, it, it looks beyond the classroom. If you think about the four that are on the screen, you could argue that those are quite classroom-based or, or school-based or, or college-based. But I think the last one that I want to mention um, is that, you know, ultimately students are going to leave school, they're going to leave college, and they're going to go out into the wider society, and they're going to engage more fully with a wider society. And that's really the fifth area that we need oracy for. And I think it's quite relevant at the moment, isn't it? That if we think about in Saudi Arabia, Vision 2030, and even in the Sultanate of Oman, uh, where they have their Vision 2040, uh, the whole point about those visions is for um, nationals from those countries, for the, for, the, for the Saudis and for the Omanis to engage more fully with, with a much wider society, not only within their countries, but also uh, beyond their countries. So how do we get it into the classroom? Well, I think there's probably um, five uh, things, five classroom practices, five approaches, if you like, that teachers uh, need to uh, embrace. So we're going to have a look at what those uh, five things are. Uh, Samuel is telling me that 2030 is also Egypt's vision. So both Egypt and Saudi um, have um, a 2030 vision. So um, the, the two letters in red are the first two letters of a missing word. So can you have a think? What's the missing word? These are classroom practices now. We need to use dialogic teaching what? And we need to re, um, engage, uh, sorry, promote co-learning. And we need to design tors, talk, tasks that promote EF talk. We need to ES ground rules and we need to teach oracy skills X. So I've given you the first two letters. You don't need to write in the box, just have a think, get your brains working. And I'll give you a word bank. Here are the words, obviously mixed up. So the six, sorry, the five classroom practices and we're going to look at each of these in a bit of detail now. Uh, number one is that we need to be using uh, dialogic teaching approaches. Don't worry if you're not sure about that. We're going to look in detail now. Second thing that teachers need to embrace is this uh, promotion of collaborative learning and getting students working in groups. No matter how reluctant we might be, we need to you know, maybe uh, backtrack a little bit and think about the groups, think about how we're setting them up, think about who's in the groups, uh, think about whether or not the group has a um, a, a comprehensible goal? Do they understand what they have to do? More importantly, do they have the language uh, in order to um, do whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing? Third class from practice is, is that we need to design tasks that promote uh, effective talk. Uh, in other words, talk that is not just mechanical, but has a, has a reason. 
we need to establish ground rules. We need to make sure that students understand what the rules are for effective oracy. I'm not talking here about uh, classroom management, you know, arrive on time and do your homework, but I'm talking about ground rules for uh, effective oracy or development of uh, oracy. And then the final one is that we need to teach oracy skills explicitly. In other words, oracy won't develop, oracy won't improve uh, just by chance. We do need to have some sort of focus on it uh, in, in the classroom and we'll see how that works um, uh, at the end. Okay, so let's have a quick look at these um, five classroom practices. The first one is to use uh, dialogic teaching approaches. Now, if you're not sure about the word dialogic, think of dialogue. A dialogue involves questions and answers. And basically what we mean by dialogic teaching approaches is that um, we want the teacher to use effective questions uh, followed by student answers, uh, student responses, which will encourage the students to think in a different way, to get them to think in terms of dialogue, to think in terms of reasoning and argument uh, and justifications, uh, and uh, to get them to think in a way uh, which will actually lead uh, to higher order thinking. So this is what we mean by using dialogic teaching approaches. Not all the time. We're not saying that every lesson um, has to revolve around uh, students working um, in groups and in pairs and having discussions, but it needs to be, um, it is an important element uh, of, of any classroom uh, uh, situation. The second classroom practice was about promoting collaborative uh, learning. And we know what this means. We know that it means getting students uh, working together. So I just want to highlight um, uh, four particular um, elements of collaborative learning. Uh, the first one is, is getting students to work in pairs. This seems like a very obvious thing, but I wonder how often we actually ask ourselves, well, why am I putting students into pairs? What's the actual point of having my students work in pairs for this particular activity? What's the benefit? Could they in fact do it uh, on their own or do they really need to be uh, in pairs? But let's think about it from the oracy perspective. Remember that um, pairs are, are very easy to organize, even if you have a large number of students. They definitely promote very high levels of uh, participation and it should ensure that the discussion is actually um, uh, focused. Um, do remember also that it's a much easier way to monitor uh, what's going on if you've got students working in pairs. Um, a second idea for collaborative learning um, is, is the idea of envoys. Now an envoy, another I've seen these um, also called um, uh, ambassadors. Uh, I've seen them called butterflies. Um, there are different different terms which are used here. But basically, uh, once once you've set up a group, uh, within each group, you uh, or the group can decide on the envoy. Uh, and the envoy's job is to, at some point uh, in the activity, uh, to leave the group and go to another group and to tell the second group what uh, their group has been talking about. Uh, to collect information and to take it back to uh, the home group. And of course, there are, you know, it's up to your creativity uh, how this is done. The envoy can go to more than one group. If you've got slightly larger groups, you could have more than one envoy. Uh, there are different ways uh, that you can do it. But it's, it's a great way to engage students um, and it takes away a bit of uh, boredom from the groups. You know, if you've got multiple uh, feedback sessions, um, uh, reporting back sessions, then using envoys uh, is a much quicker and more effective way of doing it. Third idea is um, uh, snowballs. And this is a bit like uh, think, pair, share, uh, where you start off with one student, student goes into a pair, then they go into a four, and, in, and even the four can go into uh, an eight. The, the reason it's called a snowball, if you, if you think of all those cartoons you've seen with a, a snowball, as a snowball rolls, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and usually it crushes a house or crushes a car or crushes something uh, when, when it gets very, very big. So that's, that's where the term uh, snowball comes from. As, as some of you have written, um, it, it can, it's also referred to as uh, think, pair, share, where you're increasing the number of brains uh, which are focusing on, on a particular uh, uh, task. And the, uh, the fourth one is uh, jigsaw. Um, and with a um, uh, jigsaw collaborative learning, um, 
a topic. It could be a, a it could be a topic or it could be a, a text. Um, is divided up into different parts, and um, students need to fit the different parts uh, back together again. Um, in, in a jigsaw, we have jigsaw pieces. Uh, in a text, you could have sentences or paragraphs. Uh, and the idea is that students collaborate uh, in order to put the parts back together again. The um, next uh, classroom practice uh, was uh, designing tasks that promote effective talk. In other words, making sure that the task we give our students really does engage them uh, and um, uh, results in some sort of effective talk. So making sure there's one outcome uh, for a group. This doesn't mean uh, that individual students couldn't have uh, their own, own particular objectives and goals within the group, but the whole group uh, should have one particular outcome and that needs to be linked into um, a, a time constraint. I think um, we, 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 we quite often give students probably too much time uh, for speaking activities. You have to remember their level and how much language they actually have and how much language they can actually put together uh, um, at any one time. Um, how much second language or third language they can put together. So give time constraints, keep the pressure on. Uh, you can always give more time um, if students need it. Uh, and making sure that the single outcome is also a very clear outcome. And this, this could be an outcome um, which the students have actually uh, agreed with you, the teacher. And let's make sure that uh, when we're engaging students in, in speaking activities, talking activities, if you prefer, that they're doing different kinds of things. They're not always doing the same kind uh, of talking activity and indeed the same kind of listening activity. Let, let's um, uh, make them aware of, of the different kinds of talk and the different kinds uh, of listening that, that, that are needed in order to uh, develop effective oracy skills. And very importantly, of course, let's make sure the students can um, link the activity to their own situation. And this, this links us back to what we said earlier uh, about personalization. The uh, next one, the fourth one, um, is about establishing ground rules. And as I said, these are not classroom management rules. These are not about bringing your homework uh, and coming to class on time, but these are ground rules uh, which you've agreed on uh, with the students about oracy and uh, what the students should be doing in a, in a speaking activity. Like, as we mentioned earlier, allowing other people to have a turn. Uh, turn taking would be uh, one of the ground rules um, uh, that, that you might want to establish. And these ground rules, you know, they're not secrets. They don't need to be hidden away, but these could be um, displayed uh, around the classroom and ref referred to uh, through a particular speaking activity. And the last one was uh, modeling, sorry, um, was teaching oral skills explicitly. And this is where modeling comes in. It's very important uh, that students are provided with clear models about what's expected. Now, I think we do this um, uh, without even thinking about it for writing, uh, because many of the things that students read uh, automatically uh, become pieces of writing that the students use as a model. Um, but I think in speaking, we're probably less likely to do this. But I think, um, you know, by, by pre-teaching key vocab, and I don't mean uh, topic vocabulary necessarily or topic phrases, but the type of vocab which is important uh, in different types of talking that the students are doing. In other words, the language they need, the vocabulary they, ne they need in order to discuss and to argue and to explain uh, and so on and so forth. So if we adopt the practices, how do we get it into the classroom? And um, this is bringing me to the last part of my talk. Uh, I know I've only got five minutes, so um, I hope I can get everything in that I want to tell you. So let's have a look now at how we can um, incorporate oracy into, into classroom practice. And I think the first thing we need to consider is that we need to identify skills and create a framework. Now, we don't need to do that because Cambridge has done it for us. Cambridge has the Cambridge Oracy Skills Framework. We've already looked at it. We know that the framework is there and we know what the skills are. So we don't need uh, to go through that process um, of identifying the skills and creating the framework. So that's actually been done for us. But what we do need to consider are the next uh, five things. And I'll look at these uh, briefly in just a second. First of all, or secondly, providing language support. Thirdly, giving our students models so that they can have something to look at 
and get a clearer understanding uh, of what's required. Uh, we need to consider the creation of specific tasks which will help students to develop their oracy skills. And the last two really go together, uh, reflection and uh, reminding, um, getting students to reflect and of course reminding students um, about uh, oracy in the classroom. So let's have a quick look at number two about uh, providing language support. I mean, one of the great ways of doing this is just by having things up on the classroom wall. So for example, you could have cue cards uh, on the classroom wall. These are, these are just some examples, but I'm sure you can think um, of loads and loads of extra ideas. Um, it may be that you can't actually have these on the classroom wall. So why not have packs of these uh, sets, you know, of 10, 15, 20 uh, cue cards, which you could give out to students in their groups. And then the students use these cue cards uh, during the discussions that they're having. You may decide to go for classroom posters. And there are plenty of these available. And if you look over on the right, we've even got one uh, which focuses on maths. So this just reinforces the idea that oracy is not uh, just about uh, teaching English. Uh, you know, oracy is just as important uh, in other subjects uh, as well. The third thing we need to do, sorry, uh, once you've got your language support, then of course, uh, you can give the students the topic. And for example, it might be um, wherever it is that you're living is the best place in the world to live. And we've given our students um, the, the language support through the cue cards and, and the, in the classroom posters. Then we need to make sure that we're giving our students models. And one way to do this is through observation. Uh, they could go to another school, another class, another group. There are different ways that students can see oracy in action. Uh, it could be done through watching videos, maybe some students modeling uh, good oracy skills, effective oracy skills. Uh, don't forget that you, the teachers, you're probably the best model. Um, it says on the screen that a good model, but you're probably uh, the best model. Uh, so don't forget that. Do, do model uh, what you want uh, from your students. And of course, things like cartoons and animations and GIFs, all of these um, can help you to compare and contrast oracy behavior uh, and oracy skills. And the uh, fourth um, way of incorporating oracy is by creating tasks. And here's one from a course book called Unlock. Uh, which has a series of diagrams and there are various tasks related to the uh, diagrams work with a partner work with a partner do this do that use the pictures describe the chain and then some follow-up activities work with your partner look back at the cause and effect chain add new information write phrases to describe causes and effects associated so all of these things working with a partner working with a partner working with a partner all of these uh, activities will encourage skill uh, students to uh, to develop uh, their oracy skills a couple more things to show you on reflection we can of course reflect on the task on um, on our peers and on ourselves and of course uh, we need to consider teacher-led assessment as well uh, many course books now at the end of units will have an opportunity or, or even within the unit will have opportunities for students to assess each other uh, here's a nice example this again is from the unlock course give your presentation about climate change to the rest of the class and then while you're listening to others take notes on on the questions that you have then ask the questions and this is a great way that students can assess each other uh, on, a, on a particular presentation. And this will probably be more familiar. You're, you've seen these checklists. And in fact, Ben uh, showed some examples of this this morning uh, when he was talking about the uh, uh, Cambridge framework of, of life competencies, uh, these end of unit uh, checklists, which encourage self-reflection. Teachers, of course, also need to reflect. You, you can reflect on your students' performance by having checklists and maybe having a, a record of achievement, maybe by uh, using videos. You can video and then reflect. And finally, uh, we want our students to be reminded about things and to repeat uh, the things that they should be doing. And this, again, can be done through classroom posters. Uh, remember to do this, remember to do this, don't forget to do that. Don't forget to do this. So these are the, the key elements um, of oracy. Okay, so just to uh, summarize, um, I'm not going to summarize. You're going to summarize. You could, this is something to do in your head. Please don't write anything. That's not the point. I don't want anybody else to see what you're thinking. But I just like you to consider three things. Just take away three things. Again, please don't write anything. So the first thing I want you to consider is this. 
oracy is. So tick tock, tick tock in your brains. Secondly, oracy is important because, again, tick tock in your brains. And the last one, an oracy teaching approach, which I will try is what? So hopefully those three things for you to consider will act as a summary of what we've talked about uh, in today's oracy session. I know I've taken up two minutes extra of your time. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be allowed to have any questions, but I'll hand back to Matt and Raz and let me know if I have any questions. Yeah, Sambala has some questions too. Okay. Hey. Peter, I've uh, been monitoring. Hi, everyone. Um, amazing session. I've been monitoring the chat box for you and the um, question box. Um, how long can you go on? Because we have at least 10, 15 minutes worth of questions. Matt, if you're there, um, I've ranked them. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I, I, can, I can hang around. If people need to leave, they can leave. But if people want sure. to stay, that's great. Yeah. No, one, no one's dropping off. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's the last session, right? We can we can extend it a little bit. Come on. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's okay with me. Yeah, yeah. As long as the questions are not too difficult, Sambella. <laughs> I've been ranking them. Just so ask me if you can okay help, Peter. Me to... here. Okay, okay, Matt. Okay. All right. So we've got um, we've got. Uh, I try to to rank them. Thanks everyone for asking so many. I've been monitoring them all. We have more than fifty in the Q and A box, Peter. Okay. <laughs> so I've tried to put uh, <laughs> I've tried to put some at the top here. The first one is from Nagendra Kalamadi. Can we ignore accuracy while promoting oracy among the students? Uh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah? I mean, on. Um... In Monday's webinar, we talked a lot about accuracy and fluency, and I think the, the conclusion was there needs to be a balance between the two. So it's not so much about ignoring accuracy, it's about deciding mm. what your focus is at that particular time. Yeah, accuracy mm. is incredibly important if we want to be real communicators. Uh, so I think for some activities, you need to focus more on the fluency, and in others, you need to focus on uh, the accuracy. Okay, great. Thank you for answering that. Thank you, Nagendra, for the question. Um, we have one from Fatima regarding oracy skills. You mentioned that they can be learned in the first years. So can that be applied on learning any new languages in general? I thought this followed on nicely from the session earlier where we talked about the need to learn new languages. Yes, and I, and I think some of the... Um the sub skills of oracy like the ability to justify yourself these mm. are not skills which children are going to be able to uh, develop at kg or you know in in grades one and two these are skills mm. which will develop later on so uh in in response to the question i can't remember what the question was actually but i think the question <laughs> was can all of can the they... skills be developed early on no they can't yeah. they will develop over time mm, they'll they'll develop over time and i think it for new languages in general, not just for English. Yes. I think that that was her question. Can it be applied? Yeah. Can oracy be applied in general? Yeah. Um, thanks, Fatima, for that. Um, a question from Dr. Samita Jadhav. Um, how do we incorporate oracy skills for online teaching? <laughs> I had this one from so many um, with requests about online teaching. Yeah. And I'm yeah. aware that it's kind of unknown territory for a lot yeah. of us. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't think it's an impossibility. I, I think it's mm -hmm. impossible when you've got 3,000 people in the <laughs> audience yeah. uh, because obviously the interaction is very much one way. But if, you're, if, you're, uh, uh, if the students who you normally teach at school or college are now in, in a virtual classroom and you've got the facility to have breakout rooms yeah, the uh, and room. chat rooms, um, you know, it, is, it is possible to, to speak uh, to the people, as, as I'm doing now with Sumbella. Uh, hmm. So it's not it's not impossible uh, yeah. to develop oracy skills online. Um, it's obviously not as um, easy as it is in the classroom, but but yes, it, it definitely can be done. Yeah, totally. I think it's a different skill altogether, and it may be more technical than we we'd like to admit because it may just involve learning about the use yeah. of Zoom, for example, yeah. and yeah. how to actually set up those breakout rooms and get your yeah. students in front of you one by one while yeah. the rest are working on something. Yeah, Thank you. So we have another one from Abu Obeida, Muhammad Imam Nuera, who says, how do, do, do we do effective assessment of oracy in the classroom? And our assessment came up quite a bit in the question box too. So I thought it would be good to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think the framework 
was ever designed as an assessment tool. That's, that's the first thing. The, mm. uh, and, and the same way that uh, the one that Ben was talking about the, this morning, the, the framework mm. of life competencies, it's not designed as an assessment tool. Um, mm. I think, though, whenever we see things written down on paper in nice boxes, we, we, we use them for assessment. Um, I think it, it's like anything in, in language and assessment, sorry, in, in learning and assessment, you need to decide what it is that you want to evaluate. Um, yeah. You can't evaluate everything all of the time. So you need to make decisions about what it is that you're actually uh, evaluating. And then mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the framework can probably help you um, to focus on particular aspects of, of Oracy that, that, that you need to uh, assess at a particular time. Yeah, it's um, some also have requested the ROC framework. It is available online. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, it, just just Google Cambridge ROC framework. Yeah, yeah, and then um, basically to summarise, you can use that to guide you as well yeah. Yeah. Um, in how you do it. And um, at Cambridge University Press, we have lots of uh, support for this in some of our courses, even so. Primary Path has has it embedded inside. Um, the series as well. Um, we have another question here from Reshmi Albi. You said taking turns is an element of oracy. So how would that be implemented? Can you give some examples? Debates? Um, yeah, I mean, I think whenever you've got more than one person, then there needs to be turn taking. Um, mm. You know, if you think about how you do it in your first language, then that just needs to transfer into second and third language. The, the, the point we're trying to make here is that not everybody is particularly good at turn taking. Uh, how many times have you mm -hmm. said, you know, that person never shuts up or, you know, or can I say something, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. which is intimating that you feel you're being left out. So it's, it's a really very, very important um, skill, um, not, not specifically for, for the English language, but for any language that you're using. Um, even a virtual language, even like chatting, you know, if you're chatting online, mm. um, it's very important to understand that other people need to be given an opportunity. So I think whenever you set up a speaking activity, um, you know, one of the things, you know, we mentioned this at the end about reminding students is remember that everybody needs to have a turn. Make sure that you give everybody an opportunity to speak. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, yeah, super. Um, and some of the others, another one from Fatma, kind of a technical one, can't grammar go under competency? <laughs> I like these. Um, so I when you know what you mean by competency. I, I don't, think, don't think, think I really understand the question. Okay, actually. I didn't either, but you had quite a few of, of them that went under kind of as you were talking on the slides. Okay, but the four main the four main skills are physical, linguistic, cognitive, social, and emotional. There isn't one that says competency. Perhaps so um, maybe where would grammar go in in uh, grammar goes under linguistic. Okay, so Fatma, I hope that answered your question for for um, asking about grammar. Um, and then lots of the other questions are just really dealing with how do we apply the framework and body language and self-regulation and body language. Um, so I think you can, the whole session you've given has really answered a lot of those as we've gone along. So it's a shame that we can't get to every single one, but I do hope that this has been helpful okay. um, in, in answering them. And as I was going through, um, many of you used the, um, the box, the Q&A,